I'm going to do something I normally don't do during these presentations, and, and that is I wrote this out. Uh, and because it's, there's a lot in here, and I wanted to make sure I didn't run out of time because I want to leave a little space for questions and a little bit of wrap-up. And so um, it's a new uh, presentation approach for me to actually have something written, and I'll try to make it as uh, interesting as, as I would if I were ad-libbing up here. Uh, but uh, the title of the presentation is Letter to a Young Photographer, and really what it is is my letter to you. And think of it as my personal letter to you. And, uh, and this is what I have to say. And I'll tell you right away, most of you are 18, 19 years old. I'm 64. I'm going to turn 65. So I'm considerably older. Uh, probably old enough to be some of your a grandparent, right? I mean, uh, almost at that age. And so uh, this is my letter to you as a younger person, as a young person starting out in this wonderful world of photography. What I'd like to do is start with a question. Do any of you in this room wish you were somewhere else right now? Be honest with me. You won't hurt my feelings. Somebody, somebody says yes. Here's another question for you. Do any of you wish you were someone, someone else right now? Or have you ever wished that? Well, today's lecture, my purpose is to convince you that there is no place you would rather be right now than here in this auditorium and no person you would rather be than yourself. And my greatest hope for you is that you will always feel this way down deep inside. When astronomers pointed the Hubble Space Telescope at a tiny, dark quadrant of deep space and made a series of long time exposures, They discovered and were surprised to see thousands of new galaxies appear. The light from most of these galaxies was generated billions of years ago. They had never seen anything in that little dark quadrant before. According to NASA, the image required 800 exposures taken over the course of 400 Hubble orbits around the Earth. The total amount of exposure time was 11.3 days, taken between September 24, 2003 and January 16, 2004. Might be the long, one of the longest time exposures ever taken. When I was a young child, I had a nightmare that came back often during times of illness. It was silent, stark, and abstract. Two large spheres floated side by side in a black void. One of the spheres felt like my body, and the other not. The sphere that was my body began to steadily diminish in size, while the other sphere grew larger and larger. I felt my shrinking spherical body next to the expanding other sphere, and I realized that the process was unstoppable. At a certain point, my ever-decreasing smallness, juxtaposed with the ever-expanding massiveness of the other sphere, overwhelmed me with terror. And I would startle awake soaked in perspiration and trembling, feeling that I had narrowly escaped annihilation. I had this dream many times, usually when I was feverish. The French philosopher and, and mathematician Blaise Pascal described this feeling of terror in one of the fragments of a book he was unable to finish before he died. 
These words were written more than 350 years ago, but they perfectly express the terror that awoke me from my childhood nightmare. I'll read it to you. I see the terrifying spaces of the universe hemming me in, and I find myself attached to one corner of this vast expanse without knowing why I have been put in this place rather than that, or why the brief span of life allotted to me should be assigned to one moment rather than another of all the eternity which went before me and all that which, and all that which will come after me. I see only eternity on every side, hemming me in like an atom or like the shadow of a fleeting instant. All I know is that I must soon die, but what I know least about is this very death which I cannot evade. This past spring, my 92-year-old parents moved out of their house in Syracuse after 53 years and I inherited boxes and boxes of old photographs. The most valuable picture was one of my grandmother and her little sister, which hung in my grandmother's house for all the years I remember going there as a child. Her sister had died a few years after the picture was taken of, of influenza, which killed millions of people before the creation of antibiotics such as penicillin. In this photograph, my mother holds the picture before handing it over to me. This was one of the days that we were moving them out of the house. One of the smaller pictures I inherited was this snapshot of my mother and younger brother with me on the right, taken most likely by my father in 1956. We were posing in front of Woodlawn Reservoir in Syracuse, New York. Later in the summer, our grandson Stephen, who is five years old, came from his home in New York City to visit us for a few weeks. We had a lot of fun, mostly hanging out at home and in the yard. We were concerned Stephen might get a little homesick, so we also planned a few day trips to exciting places different from his normal experience as a big city kid. We went to Niagara Falls. We went to Letchworth Park, which is a wonderful place. I highly recommend. Do it in the fall. It's beautiful. We took him to the Powder Mill Park. Oops, I'm sorry. We took him to the Powder Mill Park fish hatchery to see the brown trout. We also put him to work around the house sometimes. One thing I know for sure is that kids this age love to do real work. Stephen really likes this book of selfies I made back in 2006. The book was my first instant photo book, and I have a copy I'll pass around af afterwards. I think Kim Kardashian got her idea for her selfie book from me. At least that's what I'm claiming. By the way, you can buy that book for really cheap now. It might be a collector's item someday. Anyway, Stephen discovered that he has a talent for making faces himself. So during his visit, we made this book together. The book is available from Amazon for just $5. But I must say that a part of me finds this extremely disturbing. I think the selfie is turning out to be not a good thing. Let me digress for a moment. Here's a little snapshot of me taken by a friend in Florence in 1972. How many millions of pictures in this same location must exist in the world by now? Few of them are famous or earned any money for the photographers who took them. But the fact that there are so many of them tells us something true about the world. This place is important. The star of the picture is the cathedral in the background. The message is simple. This person was here in this famous place on this day. In our selfie-obsessed age, the message has changed. There are probably millions of selfies taken in this same place by now. The message here is, look at us. That famous building in the background is looking at us too. 
Don't you wish you were here? Too bad you're not. Your life must really suck. Okay, maybe I'm reading too much into this, but you get the picture. My message to all of you is simply this. Selfies are not good for your soul. They are the junk food of photography. Sometimes we are all tempted to take them, but photography provides us a wonderful opportunity to get away from ourselves and concentrate on the external world. Selfies do just the opposite. I feel so strongly about this that I run special selfie aversion training sessions here in the photo school. To get an A for the assignment, all you need to do is stop taking selfies. It's a very hard assignment to pass. I even created a special typeface for my campaign against selfies. But it's an uphill battle. I'm convinced the front-facing camera on our phones is the devil. You can see now where the evil idea for this book came from. Anyway, back to my story. One day, Stephen went with his grandmother, Patty, to visit his father's brother, Gus, in Syracuse. His father's brother, my son, Gus. Stephen's father is Roger. Roger's Gus's older brother. So there's the connection. I was surprised when Patty sent me this picture of Stephen standing in front of Woodlawn Reservoir. I quickly retrieved the photograph of my mother with my brother and me taken in approximately the same location 63 years before. I went to Google Earth to verify the location. There's the church in the background seen from an aerial perspective in Google Earth. I remember the name Holy Rosary School from the announcements of school closings for snow days on the radio when I was a child growing up in Syracuse. You'd listen very carefully because it came before, my school is West Genesee that started with a W and you had to wait until the end of the alphabet. And so this one always came before that and I always heard it. Here's a Google Earth view of the entire reservoir from a higher altitude. Close to the south end of the reservoir is Gus's house, right there. And here's the Google Earth street view. There's Gus on the cover of an instant book I made during a visit to his house in the fall of last year. I should explain to you an instant book is a book that is uh, created and published on the same day. And I've been doing this for since 2006, so it's, a pro it's an ongoing project. Uh, and I just happened to make one from that visit. And there's Stephen on the back cover of the book. And here are some of the connections among the photographs I've shown you. And there could, could be a lot more if I, if I drew them in. What I see in these connected photographs, and I hope you can also see, is that the present, this moment, rests on every detail of the past, every tiny decision made by ourselves and all of our ancestors. We live in a time and civilization where, in the words of the philosopher Thomas Howard, the prevailing worldview is that nothing means anything. Let's imagine, along with Howard, at least for the duration of this lecture, that this worldview where nothing means anything is wrong, and that in truth everything means something, that every little thing matters. That's what this picture is saying to me. However, if you found my picture in a box of old photographs for sale at a flea market, it would have none of that meaning for you. It would simply be a random snapshot from a long time ago. And to a material scientist, it would simply be a piece of paper with some gelatin and metallic silver particles coated on one side. But the naturalistic worldview in which reality consists only of the material substances and elementary forces of the cosmos as they currently exist is blind to the more important aspects of reality hidden within the molecules of the, of the snapshot. 
Invisible are the connections of this picture to the vastly larger and more complex reality that includes all of our memories. I am sharing some of my memories with you now. This lecture and everything going on in all of our minds at the moment is part of that larger reality. If we were to somehow expand Google Earth to encompass the whole truth of this expanded reality, it would have to include all of these details. This new Google database would need a new name, perhaps something like Google Eterna, Google Omni, or maybe even Google God. Google God would have to contain all of the pictures I've shown you, as well as the information that connects them all. Google God would make the Tower of Babel look like a small pile of stones by comparison. I, for one, am in no hurry to see this application come alive on my desktop or even on my smartphone. Some things, many things, are best kept out of human hands. So let's return now to our present world and to, in Pascal's words, our corner of this vast expanse of eternity on every side, hemming us in like an atom or like the shadow of a fleeting instant. How can these small artifacts connect us to the larger truth of reality and allow us to feel a part of it? One of the things we like most about these kinds of snapshots from long ago is that they seem to be without guile. They are the work of amateurs who think of the camera in simple terms. The camera is an appliance for recording a scene, creating a memory. The subjects in this kind of photograph are what interest the photographer and the camera is a tool for capturing them. Here's a similar picture. A photographer named Dorothea Lang took this photograph in 1936 while employed by the US government's Farm Security Administration. The Farm Security Administration was formed, otherwise known as the FSA, was formed during the Great Depression to raise awareness of and provide aid to impoverished farmers. Lang came, ac came across uh, Florence Owens Thompson and her children in a camp filled with field workers whose livelihoods were devastated by the failure of the pea crops. There is a world of information in this detail alone. We can only imagine what was going through the mind of this girl, the eldest of Florence Owen, Owens Thompson's children. One photograph from that same day, now known as the migrant mother, was widely circulated to magazines and newspapers and became a symbol of the plight of migrant farm workers during the Great Depression. The picture has since become an icon in the canon of photographic art history. Because Lang made it for the federal government, it is in the public domain, which means that it can be used and reproduced freely by anyone, including you. And there are thousands and thousands and thousands and probably millions of pictures that are also in the public domain, and you should know about those. So here are two photographs made by the same photographer on the same day using the same camera. One has been seen by only a few people digging through the Library of Congress collection, and now by all of you in this auditorium. The other has been seen almost by almost everyone in the world almost too many times. What differentiates these two pictures? This one shares a quality with my simple snapshot taken only 20 years later. Neither is famous. They have only been seen by a few people. They quietly memorialize small details of the truth of life on planet Earth. They invite us to ponder what went before and what came after for the people depicted. They invite us to think about every similar moment. Ultimately, they invite us to think about our own present moment. These two photographs, made with the same technologies in the same way as the previous two, one with a large format view camera and the other with a small 35 millimeter camera, are fundamentally different from the, previous, uh, from the previous two. They have come to be symbols of much larger aggregates of human experience. And we use them as a means of capsulizing and getting our heads around those larger things. One became a picture of the Great Depression. 
The other became a picture of World War II. As such, both tempt our human drive to accumulate power and money. Because of that, we are tempted to increase the power of these pictures by editing their photographic meaning to make a better story. The Museum of Modern Art website says about the Lang migrant mother, and I'm quoting here, as Lang described Thompson's situation, she and her children had been living on frozen vegetables from the field and wild birds the children caught. The pea crop had frozen, there was no work, yet they could not move on, for she had just sold the tires from the car to buy food. However, Thompson later contested Lang's account. When a reporter interviewed her in the 1970s, she insisted that she and Lang did not speak to each other, nor did she sell the tires of her car. Thompson said that Lang had either confused her for another farmer or embellished what she had understood of her situation in order to make a better story. The photograph by Robert Kappa of the soldier in the surf during the Normandy D-Day invasion has been the subject of much controversy in recent years. This has been researched in great detail by the famous critic uh, A.D. Coleman and several of his colleagues. Although the picture is seen by almost everyone as a summary of that epic human experience of the first day of the invasion of Nazi-occupied Europe on June 6, 1944, the truth of the picture itself may be quite different from what we have come to believe. If you are interested in learning more about this, you can find the entire story by Googling A.D. Coleman and Robert Kappa. The possibility that a photograph might become a symbol of something much larger than the subject itself is what drives many of you to pursue photo photography as a profession. And some of you may experience the thrill of making images that wield immense power and yield large sums of money. But I want to encourage you to always keep some of your photography quietly and privately for yourself. This is one of the most mysterious verses from the Bible. God spoke to the pro prophet Elijah. And he said, go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after, that, after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. Here's a photographic analogy of the idea expressed in the verse from the first book of Kings. Dorothea Lange's photograph became one of the most powerful icons of our collective memory of the Great Depression. The photograph on the right, taken a few years later by a portrait photographer named Mike Disfarmer in Heber Springs, Arkansas, was rescued from a long forgotten box of old glass plate negatives and elevated to fame in the art world several, several decades later. I quote from the book Disfarmer, The Vintage Prince by Michael Mattis. The legend of Mike Disfarmer has intrigued the photographic community for nearly 30 years. The bizarre story of a hermit-like Arkansas studio photographer named Mike, Mike Meyer legally changing his name to Disfarmer in order to disassociate, disassociate himself not only from his family but from the very farming community of Heber Springs in which he plied his trade is irresistible. But even more compelling are the pictures themselves. The beautifully sequenced book by Julia Scully and Peter Miller that introduced his work to the art world revealed searing portraits from the American heartland, captured at a defining moment in history in which the Great Depression yielded to World War II. And the sons of the farm donned their country's uniform and headed off to foreign shores. The camera's unsentimental gaze suggests a photographer who was simultaneously an insider and an outsider in his own community. Scully and Miller's book caused a sensation at the time. Nobody famous ever posed for Mike Disfarmer, Gene Thornton wrote in Art News, but his portraits are among the best ever taken by any photographer. 
Richard Avedon termed the book indispensable, his own series of, wor of rural portraits in the American West, published a decade later, reveals a kinship with and likely the influence of Dis Farmer's unblinking eye. To Sean Callahan, to Sean Callahan, writing in the Village Voice, Dis Farmer's portraits constituted a compelling and comprehensive record of the home front from 1939 to 1946, a microcosm of the nation during hard times. And in its end of year review, the New York Times hailed the book and the accompanying exhibition of posthumous enlargements at the International Center for Photography as one of the 10 outstanding photographic events of 1976, stating flatly that Dis Farmer's portraits can stand comparison with August Sander, Diane Arbus, and Irving Penn. The low whisper of Dis Farmer's photographs was transformed into wind, earthquake, and fire by the art world. And I'm happy for that. Otherwise, I would never have seen these beautiful photographs and would never have been able to share them with you. But for me, their power remains in their low whispering and not in their subsequent fame. This girl stood before Mike Disfarmer's camera one day in her hair ribbon and dress. And I think of all the thousands of previous generations of people whose every decision at every moment of their lives contributed to her being there at that moment. And I also think of all the things that may have happened to her after this moment. Perhaps someone in this auditorium is a descendant or relative of this girl. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing for us to discover? This is one of my former students, Megan Marin, who graduated from the ad program last spring. Megan worked on a long-term project photographing people in a way that would associate them with a lifelong interest or occupation. She asked me whether I would be willing to be one of her subjects. Megan knew that one of my lifelong interests has been aviation. I teach aerial photography here in the School of Photography for a good reason. My parents were both aviators and they had an aerial photography business, which is where I first learned to take pictures from the air. Her idea was to have me pose with a model airplane in an aircraft hangar at the Rochester airport. I told her that I had a small model of the airplane my parents flew for their aerial photography business. And Megan made this picture of me, which I love, in which my parents, who were both 92, year old, 92 years old, also love. Actually, they like this one better, where I'm smiling. My parents are not formally educated in the photographic arts, so they don't yet know that smiling is not OK in art photography. We can argue about that. So back to the art. After Megan sent me this picture, I was rem reminded of another picture of me from more than 50 years before. And here's that picture. I am fairly certain Megan never saw this one before making hers. This bespeaks something profound about the truthfulness of her picture. She took the time to make a photograph that reached deep into my identity and history to say something truthful and important about me. Let's compare Megan's photograph with this far more famous photograph by Magnum photographer Alex Soth. The picture is included in his book, Sleeping by the Mississippi. The book paints a dark and haunting picture of contemporary life in the middle part of the USA. And this photograph is part of Soth's vision. The only information we have about this picture is that the man's name is Charles and that he lives in a place called Vassa, Minnesota. Growing up steeped in model aviation, I have known many people who could have posed for a picture like this. I recognize the two models he is holding. In his right hand is a model of the BD-5 home-built aircraft that is known to all people interested in experimental aviation. The one in his left hand is a model called a Little Wizard, which one of my childhood friends built and then crashed into my next door neighbor's house leaving a long vertical scar in the aluminum siding and costing my friend's parents a lot of money to repair. 
I'm sure the man in the photo would tell some similar stories about his models. But Soth doesn't need us to know these, those kinds of details. He probably didn't care to learn anything about his subject's interest in those models. This man serves Soth's narrative and is not asked to share his own. So the picture does a good job of revealing some truths about Soth's impressions, but a rather poor job of revealing much truth about the subject. In addition to understanding the differences between powerful, famous, public images and quiet, private, personal images, we also need to distinguish between images that serve as icons and images that function as idols. Here's one of the most familiar icons from my own cultural background, a Greek Byzantine styled painting of the Madonna and Child. This theme has been replicated through the past two millennia in every corner of the world, in every conceivable style. Dorothea Lange's famous, photogra uh, famous photograph derives its power from the reference to the ageless pictorial theme of mother and child deeply imprinted in our consciousness. Come to think of it, this picture also refers to the same theme. as does this sculpture, one of my favorites, by American artist Willie Cole, which is in the permanent collection of the Memorial Art Gallery here in Rochester. It is important to differentiate between icons and idols. Icons appeal to our desire for what we know or believe to be true and real, and are therefore affirmative of our lives. The relationship of parent and child, old and young, is something we all value. Here I am, an old guy talking to all of you young people. The relationship of old to young has been vital to every generation of humans who have ever lived. Icons help us remember these kinds of large truths. What about idols? Idols appeal to our desire for what we know is not real, but for which we are willing to sacrifice aspects of our real lives. Idols take life away from us as they give us false hope. Once art is liberated from its reference or truthfulness to the real world, there is no limit to where it can lead desire. And because there is so much money to be made in the fabrication of idols, many of you will be tempted to do that kind of work. But although the making of idols has great potential to pay the bills and lead to fame, it will not ultimately satisfy your soul. For that, you will need to hold on to the quieter and more personal aspects of your photographic life. And the good news is that this kind of photography is always available to you and always free for the taking. Let me demonstrate. You may recall on your first day as a student here in the School of Photography, I was roaming around with my camera taking a lot of pictures. My quest that day was to find iconic images amid all the hustle and bustle of the day. I say iconic because the experience of the first day of college, or more generally, the first day away from home in a new life apart from the familiar former life, comes with powerful emotions that most everyone in the world above a certain young age has experienced. Icons can be small and private as well as large and public. As an example, here's an iconic photograph of my daughter Elaine being dropped off at overnight camp for the first time. Just as we were saying goodbye, young, uh, just as we were saying goodbye, young children wear their emotions openly on their faces most of the time. But soon they learn to cover their true feelings with false masks. My grandson at age five is already mastering this technique. The masks go on as soon as we know the camera is pointed at us. That's why people's faces are often most interesting and honest when they don't know they are being photographed. And why selfies can be the least interesting and least truthful kinds of photographs of all. Although I suppose when archaeologists of the distant future dig through our layers of strata, they will certainly get a true impression of how self-absorbed we all were during this selfie-saturated time. 
but enough about my campaign against selfies. And back to you guys. I took a lot of pictures on your first day with us, 368 to be precise, in the hopes that I would get a few good ones, and maybe even one great one. That would, that, would, that would communicate all the meaning of the experience. That rarely happens. In this case, it, 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 is, it is only from a collection of images that the full meaning emerges. I see in these pictures all the effort on the part of all of your families and communities from the time each one of you came into the world and all the lives and the work that went before your generation. Each of these moments rests on every desire, every decision, every choice, every sacrifice those other people made to try to help you navigate safely into the future. And you are now carrying the ball on behalf of those who will follow. Not that you won't have some fun along the way, but my hope for you is that no matter where you find yourselves in the coming months and years, you will take a little time each day to remind yourself of the miraculous fact of your existence. And despite all the pain and difficulty you are bound to experience, that you will be overwhelmed with gratitude. So to remind you once in a while of what I am saying, I made this book to give to you. It contains 47 of the pictures I took that first day. It's printed on paper that will last a long time, maybe hundreds of years. In it are the seeds of much future reality. Some of you will become lifelong friends. Some may become famous. Some may misplace this book and then find it when you are older and be reminded of your first nervous, awkward day in the photo school at RIT. But for all of you, these moments will remain forever as true parts of your lives, even if you lose the book for good. And if you do lose or misplace the book and can't find it, you can always buy another copy for $4 from Amazon. Or 720 yen if you're in Japan. So let me end with a few words of advice which I hope will uh, help you maintain your love of photography through all the hard work to come. <laughs> Reality is to the conscious mind what water is to a fish. You can easily learn to look past what is squarely in front of your eyes to concentrate on matters of interest and concern far removed from your immediate situation. I would guess some of you are far away from this auditorium right now, lost in your contemplation of other realities or fantasies. That's pretty much how I survived my many years of schooling. A healthy ability to daydream our way out of the present moment is a critical survival mechanism for all of us. But photography is best practiced in the here and now. It invites us to return to the present and pay attention. That's why I often carry a camera through my daily routines, even though I don't have any specific plans to use it. Just having it with me raises my awareness of what is happening around me. Sometimes this results in new unexpected work, such as this recent series of instant photo books, each featuring a selection of images recorded automatically with a camera hanging inconspicuously from my neck, shooting on an interval timer. Sometimes I end the day having taken no new pictures, but always with a heightened sense of satisfaction that I had spent part of the day fully immersed in the here and now, and thereby made a small, permanent, and meaningful contribution to the ongoing story of our world. I told you I was going to read this to you, and, and once I had written it out, I thought, well, I'll make a book about the thing, and that's what I've been reading from here. And of course, I had to publish that on Amazon. <laughs> it's a thicker book, so it's, it's, um, it's actually um, a little bit more expensive. I price these things. I, these are, this is all student pricing, right? I price them really cheap so that 
you can afford them. But anyway, I sent, I actually thought, you know, since I made the book, I'm going to send it to a friend, a friend I've had a correspondence with for more than 40 years. He's a physician. He lives in Hamilton, New York, where Colgate University is. And we've had a correspondence uh, that has mostly been pictures back and forth for all those 40 years. And, um, and so all I did was send him the book. I just had it mailed from Amazon to him, and he got it yesterday. And I was wondering, what's he going to think of the book? And so this morning I got an email from him, and all it said, the, 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 the title on the email was, Grandparents Stares. And there were two pictures. And, and the pictures were, my friend, probably 1955, I would say, and his grandson uh, a, few years, a few years ago. And, um, and I thought, you just gave me the last slide I'm going to show the students in the lecture this morning. And uh, with that, I'll just say thank you.